So thanks for inviting me here today to talk to you all about the work of the IPASS project, generously funded by the British Academy, which is trying to make precision agricultural and archeological remote and near surface sensing data more interoperable in order to support a sustainable and integrated approach to agricultural land management. Now, we are interested in doing this work and doing it now because we are all, I don't need to tell this audience, in a changing, even dynamic regulatory environment. We have the new common agricultural policy in Europe. Here in the UK, we have new agricultural and environment bills. The ELMS are being piloted. The sustainable farming incentive scheme is being rolled out. And all of these new regulations are asking farmers and land managers to do some quite complicated things. They are being specifically asked to balance agricultural productivity, so food security is still extremely important to all of us, with the delivery against various aims related to environmental sustainability, everything from protecting sensitive habitats to supporting soil carbon sequestration, to encouraging biodiversity, to deciding which areas to keep in forestry or to bring into forestry, and to manage natural and cultural heritage while doing all the rest, all within this framework of agricultural land management. And we are hearing this increasingly talked about as the need to deliver multiple ecosystem services. Now, in order to meet all of these aims, these demands of the new regulatory situation and to really do quite important work in terms of food security, environmental sustainability, and the maintenance and safeguarding of heritage, farmers and land managers need new data and new models. They need data both baseline and monitoring on soil erosion, on soil nutrients, on soil carbon, on biodiversity potential. They need models about how soil and plants and waters interact and how the shallow subsoil and the topsoil interact, not just in the short term, but over the long term. And they need this to plan land management adaptation, but critically because these schemes are outcome-based so that they can demonstrate the results of their interventions, demonstrate their agri-environment outcomes, and demonstrate their stewardship of natural and cultural heritage. So this prompts a question for me, how do we create data collections and analytical and interpretive models which meet the needs of contemporary agricultural, environmental, and heritage, both natural and cultural land management? Now, fortunately, we are interested in measuring, monitoring, and modeling many of the same basic properties when we look at these three domains. Everyone is interested in soil geochemistry, soil structure, soil moisture and salinity, documenting vegetation communities and their health, and topography. So there is a lot of potential for us to work together around a shared pool of sensing data and interoperable protocols for analysis and interpretation. And critically, I want to underscore that when I'm talking about the stewardship of heritage piece, we're talking not just about visible heritage, which is what I think people in the agricultural domain often think think about having their heads when they're considering heritage stewardship, the dry stone walls, the historic farm buildings, the upstanding earthworks, but the invisible buried heritage and archeology span that we only see in crop marks and through geophysical surveys, but which is nevertheless an integral and substantive part of the archeological record and the heritage of agricultural landscapes. And is the part that interacts most directly with present day soils and agricultural systems, because this is material that is in the agricultural subsoil and is therefore part of the matrix that creates current soil conditions and current crop conditions. So it's really important that we can address both of these aspects. And with the sensing data, we'll really focus mostly on that second aspect. So what are our strategies for doing this? We need good data. So the first strategy we are taking in the IPASS project is to take advantage of a series of key technological developments that have primarily been driven by the requirements 
uh, and the potential service requirements in the agricultural sector. So this is everything from high temporal resolution satellites, many of you may be familiar with the Sentinel satellites, to a wide and growing range of IoT, Internet of Things sensors, so little individual probes that are put in the ground and can provide ongoing monitoring data the growing range of tractor mounted sensors everything from sensors that are designed to detect weeds and target their removal to supporting variable rate applications of fertilizer and irrigation with real-time data from cameras and other sensors mounted on the front of the tractors to developments in machine learning to process integrate and extract insights from these large data sets to LoRaWAN networks and similar technologies that are essentially used to pull data from distributed center, sensors in rural environments into the cloud, to technologies to support user annotation workflows, so your smartphone app that can be used by your farmer or land manager to upload photos and provide comments on what they're actually seeing on the ground. So taking advantage of all of this and to make this concrete for us as archaeologists a lot of these technologies will feel familiar but be improved or adapted in some way that is going to help us so for example if you look at the OpDirect sensor this is an on-the-go sensor for canopy reflectance used widely in agriculture it's essentially a narrowband multispectral sensor it is configured uh, in this application we see here to be usable in a vineyard which is an environment that we are not very good at surveying in as archaeologists if you think about where we get crop marks we don't tend to look for them in vineyards uh, this sensor allows us to do that kind of work or in parallel looking at the MEXFINE, another sensor which again uh, is assessing essentially crop growth in a vineyard environment of the canopy. It is measuring uh, spectral signature, so a multispectral sensor, and also collecting data on humidity, air temperature, and canopy temperature. So we are trying to look at new sensors that are being deployed in agriculture and think about how we can interpret that data archaeologically. So that is one area of potential. We are also looking at IoT sensors. These are essentially monitoring sensors, for example, like the probe here, the labellium, which provides ongoing monitoring data on conductivity, water content, and soil temperature but at a single location at three depths down the soil profile. So these sensors can be distributed at known heritage sites. They can be distributed a single sensor at a site, multiple sensors at a site, uh, contributing data to the cloud and a network. How can we think about capitalizing on these sensors that are being put into the field for agricultural monitoring to provide ongoing information about conditions at known heritage sites? So again, looking for opportunities to create compatible data sources. We are looking at both the potential and the challenge of machine learning, particularly to deal with these large multi-resolution data sets and multi-source models. I won't go into this in detail, but to say this is an important area for us to be paying attention to. Again, because the algorithms that are used to detect crop signatures, to understand what is happening and to be able to pull out automatically change over time and anomalies are really being pushed forward by the agricultural sector and we can take advantage of that. So in addition to identifying compatible technologies and platforms or adaptable technologies and platforms, we're looking at how we can redesign sampling strategies. So spatial resolution is a key difference between applications of these data sets and sensors across the agricultural heritage management and environmental management domains. If you want to just estimate your yields, maximize production, the most efficient thing you can do is to collect your data at 10 to 15 meters. Archaeologists want to collect data at submeters. So how do we design data sets that are interoperable? Part of it, the solution is collecting higher resolution data and then downsampling when that is what's appropriate for your application. So here we have, for example, an OptRx data set, that sensor we looked at before, which provides your NDVI and NDRE canopy indexes that show you crop stress. Now, this data set is collected along a row at 30 centimeter spacing, which is quite compatible with archaeological requirements, but normally data for agriculture is collected every third row in a vineyard. It's very simple to collect higher spatial resolution data you collect in every row instead of every third row. Now, you can make that data set even more compatible by putting out a calibration panel to measure 
absolute radiance and reflectance and therefore to be able to make better comparisons between data collected different locations and different dates and providing some metadata on the crop type will make your data again even more reusable and compatible. So thinking about simple changes we can make. We can look at improving the interoperability of collection timing. So when you go to collect data, when you're going to see maximum contrast and get maximum information is again different for applications in different domains. So there's been research done by Athos Agabu and his colleagues looking at how you identify buried archaeological remains through the crop mark signatures, where he suggests that the start of the boot phase in crop development is the best time to go, that there's around a 15 day window. If you're trying to estimate yields, maximize production, again, there's actually good compatibility. There are very strong correlations in the boot phase, so you could go at the same time. But if you're trying to understand the relationship between water and nitrogen use and yield, which is important for environmental management because you're trying to minimize those things, then the strongest correlation is in the mid to late grain filling stage, according to research by Yang et al. So you might need to design a sampling protocol where you're going at two or three intervals across the season to create that maximally compatible, reusable data set. These are relatively simple things we can think through to make our data sets more interoperable. And needless to say, documenting when you collected your data becomes critical in order for other people to understand what it's telling them. A third strategy that we are taking in addition to identifying compatible interoperable sensors and data types, and then thinking about developing these interoperable protocols is improving data discovery and enabling reuse through semantics and metadata. So kind of documenting our data sets, as well as looking at some of the challenges around licensing. Although again, I will not get into that too much today, other than to say that in the agricultural sector, everything is predicated on clear and transparent contracts. And in the archeology span and heritage sector, there are many more data sets that come under some sort of remit where they've been collected in the public interest and therefore there's an obligation to archive and make them openly accessible and there's a bit of incompatibility there. I won't get into that in detail. Instead, we'll look at what we can tackle immediately, which is doing very simple things like making our data more discoverable by tagging our data sets using vocabulary that would be more recognizable to people in another domain. So we have within the ICAST project worked with the Ariadne EU infrastructure for archaeological and heritage data and made recommendations for AAT vocabulary tags, the AAT being the system that Ariadne uses, that we think will make our data easier to find for people coming from environmental and agricultural land management backgrounds. So instead of tagging a crop mark with Barrow or Hill Fork or Roman Camp, so terms that we as archaeologists and heritage managers might use. If you tag them with soil, with environmentally sensitive area, with soil permeability, with moisture content, with that kind of more basic information about what actually is being detected, what these sensors have detected, then it makes it clear what the relevance of our data is to people in these other land management domains and makes them more likely to find it. So getting into the headspace of terms that other people would use to search with is really quite important and a very simple thing to do. So we've put together some recommendations around that. We are looking at outputs that are interoperable with the kind of workflows we see in the sustainable man man land management domain. Now, many people working in this domain are using various cloud-based platforms where you kind of sign on to a GIS in the cloud and you're pulling your data sets together to make interpretations and make land management decisions. This means that raw data is much more valuable, much more interoperable than pre-processed data or reports. So again, thinking about what we deposit and really trying to make sure that our archive data is in formats that are compatible with common APIs. So anything from a GeoTIFF to a CSV to a JSON file, and that we're not only depositing the PDF report, even though that might be the only thing that's requested. So again, this is somewhere where as a discipline, we can change our practice to make our data more interoperable and demonstrate its value in the wider land management domain. 
we can, at a slightly more sophisticated level, start to rethink how we format some of our data sets to make them more reusable in applications in other domains. So, for example, a lot of heritage agencies hold crop mark data, both imagery and vector data sets. So, how do we make that more reusable in agri environment and natural heritage applications? We can think about the kinds of insights other people might want on long term trends and change in crop stress and crop development. We could be tagging these data sets using the agrovoc vocabulary that the uh, agricultural people use to note the crop development cycle as a stage when data was collected. We can do things like maybe aggregate the data together to record the date of the first detection, the date of the most recent detection, so how long a given field has produced crop mark, have information on other known detections, which builds up an incomplete picture of how frequently that field produces crop marks, pull in, if possible, data on weather conditions when the data was collected, and then include information, of course, that's interesting to the archaeologists and heritage managers about monument type uh, and the processing of the data or the monument period. So this is just an example of how you might put together a data set about crop marks that is useful across multiple domains. It is not how we format things now. We are also working to develop what we call scope notes. These are essentially health and safety warnings, little explanatory documents that lay out for each domain what the main uses are of different data types and what the limitations are on the interpretation of the data sets so that everyone can begin to understand a bit better how to use data coming from another domain. So for example, for yield data, so this is data on the amount of harvested grain or harvested whatever crop you are harvesting uh, that you get at about a usually 10 to 15 meter resolution as you move across the yield. So what is the amount in terms of tonnage of grain that you get? So as archeologists, we're interested in the potential measured yield to produce something that is a bit like a crop mark. So might give you information on larger archeological features or indicate an area with a small concentration of smaller features with an aggregate effect on crop development. So that can be explained in a scope note. And on the other hand, we are interested in helping people from the agricultural and environmental heritage uh, management side to understand how to think about crop marks and how they could improve their models of what is influencing yield and their assessment of what they're seeing by accounting for the presence of varied archaeology and what it does to a developing crop. So we have currently a bunch of draft guidance in the form of a set of documents available on our project website for public review. Please go to the link. We would love to hear from you about whether or not the guidance, the scope notes, the vocabulary tags that we're recommending are going to be of use to you in your applications or indeed if it would be feasible for you to produce them. So the fourth strategy that we are taking on is trying to develop protocols to analyze diverse data sets. So by this, we mean looking at analytical routines that rely on data and insights from both archaeology and the agri-environment domains. So for example, taking the Sentinel satellite data, Sentinel 1 and 2, so SAR and multispectral data, very high temporal resolution, revisit every five days or so, uh, publicly available, very good for monitoring the impact of land management events. So can we imagine a workflow where we take the grassland mowing and arable plowing layers, which are derived from the Sentinel data sets? So this is work that's being done through the Envision Horizon 2020 project, where they are essentially using these combined data sets with machine learning to detect plowing and mowing events on a per field basis. So can we take those automatic identifications of mowing and plowing events, look at our register of known archaeological and heritage sites, assess is the event typical of the time series. If it's not inspected on higher resolution imagery, maybe make a field visit. And then crucially, based on our field visit, make ground annotations, take images on the ground, and feed that back into the pool of training data used in the machine learning algorithm so that we can start to build up long-term assessments of the impact of different land management patterns. 
So this is a workflow that we could try to bring together. So in summary, what can we do with this kind of data? By working together, we can improve multi-sensor data set interpretation to support everyone's understanding of soil and soil crop interactions, both in terms of mapping and modeling problems. We can aggregate data to enhance models of archaeological distributions and landscape heritage characterization, and hopefully ultimately add value to sustainable land management projects by improving everyone's understanding of long-term processes. So there are lots of challenges which I've introduced today, everything from the different spatial resolutions different groups use to key analytical skill gaps, lack of awareness, lack of standards, and the usual problems around data ownership and proprietary file formats and the difficulties of data sharing. But we also think that there's huge potential by bringing together the mapping sensors and monitoring sensors, which are used across both domains to look at properties of shared interests, soil crops and topography and agricultural land to create a shared data resource that can be useful for landowners, for farmers, for farm managers, for heritage and environmental managers, and can help these groups and get, motivate these groups to work together. So we hope that you're interested in what we're doing, that you'll be willing to get involved, contribute to stakeholder and user surveys, to let us know if you'd like to participate in a workshop and to follow our project as we develop case studies and demonstrators. So thank you for listening and I hope that at this stage you will have some excellent questions for us.